exempt and the unit trains are essentially exempted from the federal oil spill response planning requirements. They're just basically exempt. Um, let's see. And also the worst case is defined as a single car. So, you know, oh, maybe you know, 63 blow up on the left. Yeah, but it's only one car that we're going to consider to be the worst case spill. And that's critical because the worst case spill out triggers all kinds of other requirements typically for equipment and personnel. Um, pipeline FRPs, something I know a lot about. Um, they have set up response zones that the industry gets to decide how big they are. And usually it's like, you know, 1,000 miles of response zone. And TransCanada put like, two trailers for the entire 1,000 miles. And, um, the worst case discharge is always defined basically the same way. They take the amount of maximum that can be pumped out, how long it takes to shut down the pipeline, the amount that will drain out by gravity, and they add that together and they determine the worst case discharge amount. Basically, the bigger the pipeline, the faster it pumps, the more oil comes up. Um, and then uh, the FEMSA says they have to identify how much response resources all the equipment and personnel, but they don't just say there's no standards for how much. So, uh, you know, under the law, they could have two Dixie cups and a teaspoon, and there's no standard for whether that's adequate or not uh, within the regulations, which is one of the reasons why that big Kalamazoo spill was such a mess, because Enbridge wasn't prepared. Um, so, and also, FEMSA has no deadlines for when they have to be submitted, there's no time frames, and they have no mandatory guidelines for anything related to the spill response plans. In contrast, the Coast Guard and EPA have mandatory deadlines, lots of musts and lots of shalls in the uh, regulatory language. And uh, this is just an example of the, their marine transfer um, facility, the marine transfer facilities, um, basically the loading and unloading facilities. And you can just sort of read through that quickly, but the Coast Guard regulations are not perfect, but they, they just lay out this much oil, therefore you have to have this much, this much many people, this much equipment, and it all has to be located within this distance, and it's very detailed, um, completely different from the of the railroads. This is all the same law. And why is this important? Well, this is an example of how much equipment it takes to respond to a spill. This is the, the summary of the equipment in the first 30 days um, from the Kalamazoo spill. You see the red circle here? That's over 2,000 people were mobilized to work on that spill at peak. And then they had 157,000 feet of boom brought in. Um, and boats, skimmers, 48. The vacuum trucks, 79. Track trucks, 77. And the tanker trucks were 19. They used a lot of bulldozers. They used a lot of heavy equipment. They had countless trailers. There's a lot more stuff than noted here. And so when you talk about spill responses, what's really important is, you know, is how much people, how much equipment you've got pre-positioned. It's where the rubber hits the road more than anything else. The planning and everything else is, you know, do you have enough and where is it located, and who's going to operate it, and what's their training, and how ready are they. And the feds and the pipelines are you know, out, you're basically gone, and the railroads are non-existent. So we'll talk about how to fix that later. Yep. That is tar sands, right? Uh, that is the tar sands, yeah. yeah the, the so they have to actually.